how does climate change impact health? We can see the, the, a lot of um, events going on, temperature increases, rainfall increases, drought also increases, and that have, that have a huge impact on various diseases. Not only spreading of the infectious diseases, it's also causing malnutrition, meaning monitoring the access to food is important, but also early warning system, vulnerable population will then face also extreme life-threatening heat, flooding, and air pollution. So these are the current situation so, Wellcome Trust, as I said this morning, for those of you who are not there, came to us to see how can we build on existing, existing country on DHS2 health system in all these countries? How can we make enhancing climate resilience for national health systems? How can we inform the health program with climate information that actually can help the country to plan better, be better prepared, and even predict? How can we, can we be able to develop climate and health analytical tools, modeling tools, and how can we be able to integrate climate and health visualization of data in the same view so it can be informed the relationship between the climate changes or even the climate, not need, even need to be changed, because that you only know if you do many, many years of analysis how it has changed over time, but also real-time climate or uh, climate data, how it impacts seasonality, uh, uh, case outbreaks, etc. So what we then need to do is actually, of course, make data available. Do we then need to digitalize local climate data? Absolutely. And get access to the local climate data? Absolutely. But if that's difficult, we have already worked on the climate app before we call it climate data app, but it's ending up to be only the climate app. So that I mentioned this morning that we will also hear more about today, and but we hear even more on Wednesday because then we will hear about the, the kind of the tools we have developed, then the climate app, how we can integrate already data available through the air of five land through google earth engine to get hold of the satellite data combined and verified together with the data from countries reported through the wmo and getting directly imported as an extension as we were talked about this morning into the dhs2 per org unit but also per disease that can create awareness advocacy but also it can actually be used in order to, to learn a bit about the relationship between the, the climate data and the diseases and the cases. Yeah, it is to work. So we also develop a data modeling tool that we also will discuss on, uh, on Wednesday. We will hear the latest news from the hackathon last week, how far they have come in order to be able to see how can we build up a um, toolbox platform to be able to reuse, share already existing modeling tools. There's a lot of researchers out there doing one-off experiments, testing, interventions. How can we look at this in a more systematic way? How can this be reused? How can it be country-owned? How can it be used in countries using the DHS2 approach? also on the modeling tool, because we see that is necessary in order to be able to be to share all this knowledge about modeling. So that also will be discussed on, on um, Wednesday at two o'clock, ending also up with a consultation that you can actually ask, ask questions about your country and so forth, both of the climate app and the CHAP, climate health ass assessment modeling P platform. <laughs> in the making. The, the, the A is changing as we speak. And of course, the design of these visualizations. And what you also need to do is actually to build a network of collaboration because this climate health that we have started, that welcome to us now, we actually have two years to show evidence whether we can prove 
the concept, whether we are able to do any impact, or is it possible to show that there are any way of doing uh, the then informing the health program with weather data, if you look like that, in order to be better prepared. Is, is that possible to be done in, in, in one and a half year? That is what, what the Welcome Trust are testing us in, in order to be able to get the six, six new years. So we originally applied for eight years, we got two. And that's why, um, we are here today also. We have had 10 countries already experimenting, but also three of them having it in operation, the data, the DHS2 uh, climate app, to be able to see how can we actually do impact in real life, not only in the laboratory. So this is the, the climate app I, I, I showed this morning. And I don't want to spend more time because I'd rather hear, about, hear from all these countries and all the people. And we will, you, you can look up all the resources and we will have this one um, dwelling in the back maybe later. But there are webinars, there are YouTube videos. There's a lot of resources, global resources that can check it out where we, uh, where we are at now. And we will make more, don't we, Patrick? So when people say Patrick is not on the list, it's because Patrick has been presenting this app three times a week for many, many weeks. So Bjorn doesn't need to, okay? And then I have to just show and tell and dance a bit before Patrick is presenting. So today Patrick is released, he's not presenting, but he had do, doing a lot of other presentations this week. So can I then get Lau on the stage? the two representatives. John Lewis from his Vietnam, and then the representative from Lao Meteorological Service Institute. I'm, I was able to say it. Uh, Who's talking first? That she goes. Okay. Oh yeah, you are too. Let me turn on this one. Yep. Then I can, oops. And we will have time to get some time. Yes, let's, let me introduce myself. My name is Virani. I work for the uh, Department of Meteorology and Hydrology, Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment, Laupedia. I would like to introduce introduce about meteorology and hydrology, tropical storm forecast and early warning. Uh, the DMH is mandated to monitor and maintain on meteorological and hydrology earthquake and observation network in Laupedia, including climate service, flood and drought, forecasting agro meteorology and early warning in the whole country. This is the flood early warning system. And also uh, we uh, have a station for flood early warning. And this is the early warning flash flood. Actually, we collect data using uh, automatic and manual data collection and using FFG tool and then analysis and disseminate. Uh, this is early warning flash flood. Uh, in Lapidia, starting from June of October, record water level along the river basin at dam. Warning for two days. And uh, 
we observe one warning level and danger level also. This is a disseminate of forecast and warning. Uh, actually, we are uh, water resources and environment, and we 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 uh, collect in the DMS and send around the government government uh, uh, agency and also uh, provincial area, and we record to uh, radio, newspaper, television, and we also uh, send to international organization. And this is the weekly weather report and warning. Actually, we record every day, every day. one day, uh, one day, uh, four times, three times per day. Uh, uh, we record to um, Facebook and YouTube also, and we record radio and also website. Uh, uh, this is uh, the location uh, meteorology station uh, and hydrology station in Laos. Also, we observe uh, satellite uh, connect from Korea also and uh, for uh, radar, radar sat. Uh, I would like to uh, talk about uh, Lao Climate Information Service for agriculture. Uh, Lao Pida is a country based on production as well as agriculture. It's developed depend on natural for most part and there are some reasons that lead to the harvest not being food of seed, not recording the target set due to natural disaster, threat to epidemic, to crop, livestock, and peace. Uh, uh, the LAKS are responsible to two ministers, uh, line ministry is natural resources and environment and Ministry of Agriculture and Forest. Uh, uh, we use the uh, meteorology and hydrology uh, our mandate. And also the uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Forest also collect uh, uh, related database on agriculture. And this is a climate information service in Laos, the uh, system managed the process acromit and meteorological data according to content and meaning to the data. The system view generate acromit data by analysis, meteorological data and crop cycle data. Uh, also, we have a seasonal forecast and summary report every seven day. And uh, smart farming also uh, Farming report also. Uh, we 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 record uh, drought and heat three, also case one warning also. This is the uh, agriculture. Uh, this is the uh, information flow process of Laksa. Uh, the information uh, section where the station agriculture information and the central information where the forecast. Uh, uh, as a response, uh, the Department of Meteorology and Hydrology, uh, we we uh, collect database and and uh, into the computer system and analysis, and then report to the agriculture and inform them the local area farmer re also farmer record also, and this is uh, the agent um, <coughs> calendar calendar. Uh, Meteorological information weekly report, and this is some uh, uh, information: drought and high risk, uh, high temperature, also epidemic season, uh, and this is the uh, public of information meteorology and information also. Uh, Alexa, we use the. Uh, application with the mobile phone and actually my first time come here I would like to uh, uh, extend not only allow agriculture 
uh, we, we, we must uh, combine, um, uh, uh, develop, develop uh, the system Laksa, uh, combined with the uh, um, um, Ministry of Health also, uh, because we need to, to uh, early warning to them about uh, disease, about uh, malaria or some uh, um, uh, according to the health. To the people in the local area using a mobile phone, um, using climate climate data in health, I would yeah. like to invite. Uh, sure. uh, yeah, that's fine. KSIP Vietnam. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, I guess they can all hear me, right? You want to online? Okay. So right now, what we just saw, like like if you just see the previous slide. The law meteorological um, data was sent to all the places, including WMO and Ministry of Agriculture, but not Ministry of Health. But like what we are trying to do now is to have climate data to be used on health. To show before, I'll just like give you a bit of background about entire law for next 35, 40 minutes. No, 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 just one slide. <laughs> just to give a bit background about law, where it started. The DHS2 was started in 2013, 2014, it's 10 years. We include all kinds of different diseases in DHS2. As you know, DHS2 have three different models. One is aggregate, we started with aggregate, then it was even, then it was tracker. I'm not going to go to all the three different details because we are in DHS2 annual conference. So we should all know about these three models. And what we tried to do was is to get all different kinds of diseases inside DHS2. And that doesn't mean what we've been trying to do is just only working with HMI's department, but also all the other health program department, including surveillance, including OPD uh, department of uh, health, uh, department of uh, malaria department, um, and all the other department, and like getting the data inside DHIS2. You know, like in DHIS2, we also had a prediction model, but based on the weekly data of the disease surveillance, we used to predict, right? That was only focusing on the health data itself. So now we want to try to just say, okay, like we want to try to include the climate data, what we can try to do, how things are. So for that one, first thing is climate relevant. Is climate change relevant? Yes, it is relevant. This is for now. I'm also going to just tell a few things about Norway too. In Oslo, if you remember, two weeks or three weeks back, we had flooding here. That's true. You can ask all the Norwegians. Like even in the metro station, the water was flooding down. Even when they've opened the, the tramp, the water was going in. That's also the similar kind of, uh, it's not that same as in Lao, but Lao was a bit more, where the dry season is longer and the rainy season are shorter and very intense. That gets more into flooding and all things. Last year alone, uh, waterborne diseases had accounted to 10% of uh, under five death. So this is, there's a direct correlation between all different things. So due to that one, like we just like say, how best we can try to include the climate data and at least like predict few of the, uh, the cases in, in here. And these were the few diseases which were been identified to try to look through waterborne, foodborne, vectorborne and all different kind of effect and how does it has to all places. You might know all these things like in Paris Agreement in 2019, it was like um, public health uh, was as one of the seven sector for the increased resilience. And then like what in the law, what they did was four sectors were included. Like when we talk about health, Ministry of Health does not do by itself. We also have to work with other different ministry. For example, ECRVS or CRVS, which is works usually handled by Minister of Home Affairs, Agriculture, we also need to do, and the climate also we need to try to do. So there were multiple four key sectors were identified, agriculture, forestry, water resources, and, and human health. These were the four sectors. Uh, under health, what we had is uh, health, HDAP, health adaptation plan, which was uh, created and given for the ministry to agree on it. In Lao, we, apart from the Welcome Trust, we also have Green Climate First funded by um, save the children from the Australia, so where they have given $26 million to try to just see like how best we can try to improve on this process. 
And then there was for the health side, they added the six um, strategic direction and also 10 operational framework. Given this background, first thing, what data we have. Lao had a very strong DHR history. It's been going on for 10 years. So we collected all the different data, not only aggregate, but the event, plus also the location where the diseases were recorded. Not only the hospital, but actually the people locations. We do that one. What we did was is each and every village was a GPS, had a GPS coordinate. So whenever a person is saying like, I have uh, dengue cases with severe warning, they even get the location of where that particular person is coming from. So we could have done both uh, health facility wise analysis for the case burden, but also location wise analysis where the things happen. This was done based on um, Beyond's uh, map app. Like in uh, DHRS, we have the map app where we can like put all different kind of things. And then a few years back, a uh, couple of years back, like we also had the weather the temperature layer, so where we it's a raster layer where we can try to put it down and get all the linkages up. And that was okay, but we didn't give a much other different details. So what we tried to do was we talked to Mandre and like we just say, can you please give us your data? So we got provincial level weather data from the Mandre. We inputted all those things into DHRS2. We had all the data. So then we just say, okay, let's just focus on two. One was on dengue, one was on diarrhea. Let's just focus on these two diseases and just see if there is any correlationship. And if we can try to ask some of the universities who have this modeling kind of things, and we can try to use that one up. And then this was what was happening. And then Beyond made a very nice app, which he's going to present. Really, it is a good app <laughs> where we can actually get the climate data directly into your organism. And then you can compare between your disease data and the climate data if you don't have local weather station data. And we even compared the local weather station data with ERFI, and we didn't find much discrepancy because it's a few things we need to try to understand, but it is okay, we can try to understand. So what we did was WHLO along with all the people, like we worked with the University of Gothenburg, who had this modeling thing. They tried to make the early morning system where it compared the last, uh, few years um, dengue and, uh, and diarrhea data and compared with the weather. And then they try to predict these are all the different things what happened. Again, this was only at four points only that particular time what we got the data. But now we are getting more data down, but not only the health data, we have it by the villages, but the weather data we had only by province. But we had to work with the Ministry of, of uh, Monterey, our meteorological department, to get all the weather data so that we can compare and analyze the data more at the local level. So if you can just like see around here, this was the, the map. No one can see what the, the graph is because it's too tiny. It was a weekly disease spread about the, the dengue cases and then the, the climate thing. So there were some kind of uh, changes or co-relationship between these two. Then what we did, we cannot go to uh, just Ministry of Health alone. We need to have collaboration with um, uh, DM, DMH or DHM, Department of DMH, Department of Meteorological and Hydrology. I'm within Monre, Ministry of something, something. So we worked with them and we just said, okay, let's just like try to get all different things. Let's see how your data can be worked together with us. And they also have challenge. This doesn't mean that like we also have challenge where we have disease data coming from different departments and all kind of things we have to do integrate. They have more different challenges because they're, they're donor. They have multiple donors, ADB, China, JICA, all these things. They are from the things, they are also from the equipment. And this equipment will also have a different software. So they have to manually put down everything together, analyze, and then send the data up. So it's also, challenging to try to understand how things are. So we conducted two days kickoff meeting and just say how best we can try to integrate between these different ministry. And we also got to look at what they have done in the agriculture and how can like we say, how can like both the ministry combine together, give a message to the public that, okay, next there will be a heat wave happening. And then like in Laos, we also have slash and burn in most of the things after the things where we air quality will reduce down. So we also try to get the air quality data from other places. And then like we try to work on a um, more coherent way where we have a phased manner of implementation of the data 
pilot in few districts and few provinces and then roll out to other places. Up. So these were the two processes what we did. The first process, the current process, which was happening, where all the data was pulled into DHRS2. That means the daily weather data and as well as the daily disease data, which was already collected in DHRS2. Then like we tried to send that data to E1, that's the system which was made by Gothenburg in R, where we send both the data and they does the prediction, and the prediction is sent back to DHRS2. This was what's happening, so that like we can try to do some kind of early warning and all. Now, with the uh, University of Oslo chat, which you're going to hear more, so where we can try to not only include the data from the, the local weather station, but also from era five, where it goes all to chat, so we don't have to put everything inside DHRS2. And then like we can try to push only the prediction and only for those particular diseases, which we can try to use for early warning. This is again, still in development and testing phase. Based on the last week uh, things we managed to install in the Lao thing, we want to try to test out what the, the model is working from the previous one and now. So these are all the, the plans and things what we've been trying to make. First thing is a working agreement between two ministry department level so that like when the MOU signs, then like we can try to take things more further, but like we should start now. So we have a department level agreement so that like we can work together, share the data, get all the information and do a proper study and give the feedback to the global community. That's basically it from La. Hello. Okay. So, um, my question is this: um, Which uh, predictive models did you employ throughout the whole process? Because from a data science point of view, I need to speak to my prediction with all confidence that, okay, this is my error margin, you know, yeah. my best of it and all that, because from where I come from, people will question you, right? So yeah. if you could share the maybe modeling, predictive models that you use yeah. throughout the whole process then. Actually, what I know about predictive modeling, there were two predicting modeling, which were used by Gothenburg. And I guess like that will, you can talk to our data science person sitting over there. They can like guide you with not only that one, but there is also a Barcelona one. So there are multiple predictive modeling they can try to use for different kinds of diseases. But like what we've been trying to do, we are just like feeding into predictive model. We don't even know what model is that. We get some kind of things and like, we are only focusing on the health side. <laughs> but he's the right person to talk with. Yeah, no. The point is that we have meteorological data for a lot of years. We have health data for a lot of years. And I didn't hear you say that you're using historical data, which I would assume would actually be easier to, uh, to as assess modeling based on historical data that's already been cleaned up and so forth. So why don't you do that? It looks like you're really into an experimental phase where there is this vague promises of, uh, of a pie in the sky here, but you're not actually doing retroactive or, or you know, historical analysis of available data. Yeah, no, 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 actually that's exactly what we've been trying to do. In La, unlike in the climate data, what we included was last nine years. And then like we try to use that model and just say, if that's working for current year, that means like from 2022 and we compared with 2023, at least with that particular model, even like when they try to make, and then like we just say, these are all the things was happening. And then we have to take it next further, right? So one thing is to just to uh, assess the predict, uh, predict whether it is right or not. Both the historical data were there, but just to feed into this model and get it back. Is that what you were trying to do to ask? I would have said then go ten years back and then compare with the health data from last year. I yeah. Would say yeah, exactly. That's what you're yes, <laughs> comparing last ten years data uh, and for 2023, we are in 2024 right now. So only like just say if 2023 worked. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I 
I think we should read the lovely discussion about the respect, Janvi, because we have a very sharp history. And please, and uh, you can also go on discuss with the lovely people sitting over there in the break, because we would like to hear the, the country stories. Can? Can, can. Okay, then we, we move over. Or do we, we need to check uh, the um, slide deck? But uh, let me introduce the Malawi people. If we can maybe introduce both of you. Yeah. Again. All right. Uh, good afternoon. I hope it's. I'm clean up, right? Is the audio right? Yeah. All right. So uh, I'm Tuong Amanda from. His Punima in the University of Malawi. So this is uh, Charles Vanya is from the Department for Meteorological Services or Climate Change and Meteorological Services. And then also contributing to the presentation, but sitting somewhere deep in there is uh, Dr. Lucin Tiatika, who is the director. There she is. I mean, trying not to be seen there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we'll, we'll talk about the processes that we currently engaging in, in, in trying to uh, set the, the climate and health conversation going in Malawi. So initial steps, so just looking at the intersection of uh, climate and health, and then also climate and malnutrition, and then climate and infectious diseases as well, and then uh, climate services for health, and then uh, some forward uh, outlook. So I think parts of this have already been uh, touched on to say, I think, we need to look at the intersection of uh, climate and health to understand the, the possible impacts. So either from climate change itself or just climate uh, variability. So this could be, for example, primary effects such as increased uh, ultraviolet radiation exposure, which may lead to uh, premature skin aging or increased air pollution, you know, through propagation of uh, air pollutants, and then also uh, address events that may lead to such as droughts or flooding, which can create favorable conditions for, let's say, uh, cholera or malaria, but also uh, drought may lead to, let's say, uh, crop failure, which may put populations at risk and then leading to uh, malnutrition, for example. So uh, picking on that, uh, case of malnutrition, which is one of the things that we are trying to, to pursue. Uh, UNICEF statistics from 2018 did show that in as much as most of the children in Malawi are born with the right age, but 23% uh, of all child death cases are related to undernutrition. And then also 37% of the children in Malawi were affected by stunting. Things have improved somewhat, but now I think the, the current report shows that that's at 34%, uh, so still a long way to go. And then uh, climate change or variability may affect food production or the quality of food, which may put uh, households at risk, either like from them reducing how much food they, they take, uh, taking smaller portions, or also the food quality itself might be affected and also from club failure may have reduced uh, dietary diversity. So I think one thing from the conversation that we've had is that there seems to be some, some gap despite the efforts that are there, like from seeing uh, given climatic conditions and then when there's an uptick in cases of malnutrition, for example. And then this is uh, mainly due to weak early warning systems and the reasons being uh, inadequate use of you know, climatic information in decision making or making predictions, but also a lot of the useful systems that can feed into the process of making analysis and also some required predictions are, are sound. And also in the way uh, information is presented, there may be weak capacity at district level or sub-district level uh, to make the appropriate decisions. So what then are we uh, trying to do? So what we're working towards in the uh, current phase is to leverage the, the DHIS2 to pull information from different sources and then uh, build predictive capabilities for that. So still early stages, we've mainly been working on uh, 
seeing the practices that are there on the ground, the, the systems that are in place and the associated uh, practices. So like from the med services, there's uh, the, the map room, which was generally developed by IRI. Uh, he'll talk about it in, in, in his part, but there are also some other useful information systems such as the National Nutrition Management Information System, where you'd have data, for example, for community management of acute malnutrition, but there are also efforts such as a family in Newark where caregivers have been trained to take Newark uh, measurements. So fortnightly or when there's, there's need. So this system is a DHIS2 based platform. And then there's also the National Health Management Information System, which has uh, nutrition information and other uh, disease related data. It's also a DHIS2 based platform. And then we're also supporting the National Agriculture Management Information System which has uh, instruments such as the rapid food situation assessment. So it's a protocol based tool that you'd use to assess the food need for a household, like for a given period, based on the number of people and then the ages, you can see the food requirement and then you run various things to then determine whether a household is uh, food secure or not. And then there are also uh, tools for classification such as the uh, IPC, food security phrase classification that would want to leverage. So we want to pull data from these various systems, uh, leveraging the, the DHIS2 platform. So uh, besides that, I think John in the Laos presentation did talk about the EWAS. So I think a similar WHO system is being implemented uh, in Malawi. So we've been uh, in, in collaboration with the uh, climate health focus section within the, the Ministry of Health to support the operationalization of this system. So in four districts where uh, pilots uh, have just sort of like uh, kicked off, so support the, that work. But also there is uh, an ongoing discussion in terms of uh, uh, using the same for, for cholera, but this is also being a separate platform and yet you have the national agriculture, uh, not the agriculture system, but the health management information system would want to integrate the outputs from this uh, EWAS into the HMIS uh, platform so that health managers can have you know, access to the predictions and the data that they need uh, in, in one place. And then uh, John also did talk about the DHIS2 uh, climate app. So we are working to leverage this and see how we can you know, incorporate climate data into the national DHIS2 platforms that are in place. So as I've said, we've, we support the Ministry of Agriculture. So in our collaborations with them, they've given a go ahead to have this uh, app installed on the uh, NAMIS production server. So the reason also is that in the setup for Malawi, you, you do have agricultural extension workers as part of the mechanism for collecting uh, weather and uh, climate data in the in the country. So besides that, also we are uh, involved in the development of the community health information system. So that's also installed there. And this is where these uh, screenshots are from. So on the development servers for the IKIS, that's where we also trying to see how we can uh, interact with this data. And I think once the tests are done and also wider consultations are had with uh, the broader ministry, we'll see how this can be leveraged, for example, in the HMIS and also in the production servers. But with the data that we're pulling in now, so this is leveraging our global data sets such as uh, the Eura5, but there are efforts also to try and leverage uh, local data sets from the med services. So this is where the med services uh, come in handy in terms of the, the operations and support for uh, climate health and agriculture as well. So over to uh, Charles. Uh, thank you very much. Taking, taking from where my colleague has just talked. All right. Um, there, um... I'm going to uh, take it to uh, yep.
I do it. Okay, so uh, here I'm going to look at the intersectoral collaboration, uh, which is the currently there. Since uh, 2016, the department has been working with Ministry of Health, uh, as well as the uh, Ministry of Agriculture, uh, through the Global Framework for Climate Services uh, Project, which was being uh, implemented in Malawi and the Tanzania then. And the, uh, the image you are seeing is the, uh, a training session where we are training our stakeholders on how they can use the map room that was developed uh, during the uh, project. So uh, for uh, global framework for climate services, the intention was to improve the management of climate-related health risks as well as the enhance the health sector ability to use climate information and the, as well as the strengthening the uh, climate services to enhance the resilience and the protecting health. During our involvement, uh, the Ministry of Health through uh, World, the Madrid, uh, World Health Organization uh, was working hand in hand with the, our department in terms of uh, um, how they can uh, undertake the activities that they are doing uh, using the committee and the data information which we are providing. And the, through the collaboration mechanism, um, we are providing the, we are providing and we are still providing the error warning uh, information um, to the Minister of Agriculture, Minister of Health, and the other uh, institutions, as well as the uh, exchanging data with the Minister of Agriculture for proper, proper estimates, and the, also Minister of Health, particularly through the map room where we developed um, indicators for likelihood of malaria outbreaks using the calamity data that we collect. And the, uh, the image that you are seeing, this is the, uh, a training support which was provided to two districts uh, in the country where we are uh, training the health sectors in terms of how they can make use of the climate information. And the, uh, the development also support uh, particularly in terms of food security, the Ministry of Agriculture, by providing uh, capacity to the extension workers who work with the uh, the local communities in terms of how they can make use of the climate information in order to improve their uh, crop production, in order to make sure that we minimize the impacts of uh, malnutrition and the like. And the, uh, this is just an example of uh, the uh, map room output, uh, which was uh, generated using the seasonal climate information. We were able to come up with the suitability of uh, malaria um, outbreaks across the country. Um, information which could be uh, used by uh, uh, Minister of Health in order to uh, maybe make sure that they plan in advance and the, uh, reallocate uh, resources. And the, at the same time, as the development, we we have also been looking at the, the seasonal climate outlook, which has been provided as the, an early warning tool for various sectors, including the health sectors, uh, particularly in terms of uh, uh, disease outbreaks such as the malaria as well as cholera. And the, we also produce the agronomic bulletins which provide guidelines to uh, farmers in terms of uh, what they need to prepare ahead as well as the, uh, the likelihood of uh, any weather extreme that they may face. Uh, at the same time, we, we are also providing climate projection for uh, the agriculture sectors, particularly the eight agriculture sectors in the country. We have been generating uh, the climate protection for each division in order for 
uh, sectors within the division to make use in terms of uh, how they can plan ahead uh, for mitigation as well as the uh, adaptation in relationship to uh, how climate is going to impact various uh, economical activities within the basins. And the, uh, at the same time, we are also sharing the I mean, data as well as the personnel. Um, then we, for sector information production, we, we generate climate risk maps, uh, which are being used by uh, various sectors as well as the, I've already talked about the season climate outlooks, but the, this one is also being used uh, by various sectors uh, within the country. At the same time, we also generate climate indices, uh, particularly looking at the start, cessation, length of the season, number of dry spells that may occur in a season in order to make sure that the uh, various sectors, including the health sector, can also make use of the information because we know that by providing this information, it can give guidelines in terms of availability of water, uh, as well as the how uh, crops are going to be impacted. And the, we have a lot of benefits out of uh, the collaboration that uh, is uh, undergoing, because this is uh, improving our ability to anticipate and respond to climate-related health issues, uh, particularly with the, uh, the Minister of Health which I've mentioned. And the, it has also strengthened our skills and the knowledge of professions uh, through training and workshops that we, we have been undertaking. Then there's also greater awareness among the general public in terms of the impact of climate change. As I've already said that through a, a program called PIXA, which is the Participatory Integrated Climate Services for Agriculture, we are training uh, intermediaries who goes and also train the farmers in terms of how they can take action as well as respond to all the climate uh, variability that may happen in their area. At the same time, there's a better utilization of climate information to inform health planning, uh, research, public health response to climate related disease. And the, uh, in terms of data sharing, um, Currently, I would say that uh, um, based on the case needs, there are those people who are demanding data for a specific need to address, but at the same time, we are also providing or uh, rather sharing products only. Then we, there's also um, data sharing with the uh, Minister of uh, uh, Health uh, in Madden. Uh, wash, as well as the Minister of Agriculture in APES, where the data is being used for crop uh, production estimation. And the, although uh, there are all these um, things that I've mentioned, challenges are there, we have particularly uh, in terms of data collection. Uh, the collection is inadequate currently because there are some more very uh, hot spots that doesn't have uh, a very uh, good observatory points to make sure that they monitor how well is they happening. Then there is also inconsistent data integration because um, the tools that we are using to collect the data uh, have different formats. So when this data comes to us, it's uh, very difficult to, or rather it takes time for us to make sure that all the data can speak uh, in one format. So because of the uh, variation in the formats, then we, there are also some coordination challenges. Uh, in the project of uh, uh, Jeff says with the Minister of Health, we had uh, a lot of challenges in terms of uh, how the Minister of Health could uh, make use of climate data that we were providing. So this was uh, like uh, a first uh, or rather a new thing to them in order to make use. So it was indeed very difficult. And the limited financial resources for uh, conducting research. The new uh, strategy for future collaboration that we have is to enhance data collection, integrating 
and the analysis, which we are seeing that the, through the DHS S2, uh, we'll be able to uh, make sure that this can be addressed. Then we also need to identify and secure long-term funding sources to support ongoing collaboration, as well as creating uh, comprehensive policies that can integrate climate and health, which currently, I would say that uh, are not strong. And the, there is also a need to increase involvement of local communities in the decision-making processes to ensure more effective and sustainable outcomes, as well as the setting technical working group for climate and health. Then the, looking forward uh, for partnership and the in, innovation, uh, through, throughout the presentation in the morning, I've seen a lot of opportunities where, uh, as a department, we can get engaged in, in order to make sure that uh, we move forward. So uh, we need to extend the DHI2 climate app to leverage local climate data uh, by integrating it with the IRI-developed data library that we currently have. And the, uh, we need also to integrate the tool with our agro-meteorological briefing data um, data source where uh, NAMIS provided data. Then we, we need also to develop, or rather the development of DHI2 instance for ob observation reports, because currently the observation which are being done in the stations are collected the monthly. But instead of being collected the monthly, we are thinking of uh, trying to automate uh, the collection so that the, they can be uh, sent instantly. These are some of the things that we, we have uh, in mind. These are just the, an example of uh, the orientation of uh, map tools that we are doing at the University of Malawi with our colleagues. Then uh, here it's uh, in our office when we brought our colleagues from the University of Malawi uh, during our collaboration so that they, they can also see how we work and uh, thank you very much. data sharing among between the meteorological uh, services uh, institutions and the Ministry of Health. Do you have any advice? I know we're coming to Mozambique as well, but I'm very sharing. Uh, spirit, but we see many countries that this is kind of the mon one of the main obstacles. Any advices, or maybe I'm posing the question to the wrong people? No. Well, uh, I was looking at the. Uh, am, am I audible? Yes. I was looking at the, my director. If the. the it's exciting. I'm saying this because, as you have rightly said, uh, data issues in the, most of the national meteorology services becomes a very big challenge when it comes to like uh, open sourcing it. Hmm. So uh, in Malawi, currently, what we are doing is the uh, through collaboration. If I'm working with the University of Malawi, then the accessing data from us could not be a challenge. Other than, okay, we, we encourage collaboration. Other than uh, an institution just demanding that you bring us data we want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we know through collaboration, we are going to learn something and they're also going to benefit something from us. That's so what we do. With the ministry? How will then the situation be if you collaborate with the Ministry of Health? I'm okay. not talking about the research. Yes, uh, mix. yes. Similarly, with the Ministry of Health, because we, we know that uh, 
the data that we are talking about here is a public good. So if the, the intention of accessing that data is to help the general public, then the data becomes free Super. because we know the intention Super. is for the good. Couldn't be better. Any questions from the audience? Then I read you. I'm afraid you have to run. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, hi. It's a kind of follow up because uh, I was uh, asking myself the same question if there is a framework of collaboration between ministries, because we see agriculture here, information system, we see uh, integrate community health information system, and also on the technical level, how that works uh, right now. Are the separate information system instance, and you have like data interoperability setup of framework, or is it trying to aggregate everything in the National HMIS DHS2 instance first uh, that is done. How that collaboration works also on data governance uh, for now, and if you have advice or lesson learned to share. All right, um, thanks. So I think in terms of the the governance, there are several uh, layers. So as I said, in in part in terms of let's say the the data collection for the observations. So the the setup is that. With the, the med services, they do have the, the stations and, and stuff, but the Minister of Agriculture, for example, is also contributing towards the, that process because the frontline workers are part of the data collection mechanism. So that provides for the for the sharing. Uh, but also like with the, the Minister of uh, Health, I think there's been a uh, standing MOU, which they're revising now to, to guide uh, that, that work. And then also in the collaboration, for example, with the, the university, I think we've sat and discussed the points for, for an MOU. Uh, but in terms of the, the data platforms now, I think then you do have the, this multiplicity of, of, of data platforms, uh, which we're trying to correct through this initiative. Because like these frontline agriculture uh, workers, you know, they'll have dual reporting. So send data to the National Grant Management Information System and send data to the to the med services. But like through these current efforts, we like where you talked about that DHS two instance, we also trying now to provide uh, that provision for sort of like a machine to machine uh, data exchange and also when there's when there's need. So I think that's the the current direction. Thank you so much. for the next paper because in the United States with the speakers coming all the way across America to present for us we cannot let them you know not having time to present so we are dividing the time as equal as we can so welcome the Mozambican team <laughs> Should I? Is it okay? A, a very good morning. A greetings from across the mile from Mozambique, wishing all of you a very good uh, conference. My name is Aderi Toramosh. I'm the general director of Med Service in Mozambique. I have my colleague there from Malawi. I saw oh. deputy director from Laos. So all of us, we are willing to deal with this big community of uh, DHSI, it's difficult to remember this. <laughs> I'm with my colleague from the health center and my work is very easy. I think I'll take just five minutes. The 30 minutes will be for you. Yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the world has changed of thinking if the climate change is happening, now what we are doing is what to do due to what we have, we have been seeing here. And because of that, all of us as government, we have agreed during the Paris Agreement that we needed to go to mitigation and adaptation. And we have made service, we are following adaptation by bringing L1 in so that the, the community can get the resilience. Resilience is to uh, keep living with all the extreme events that the IPCC reports are telling that the events will be becoming more and more uh, powerful. So, and we cannot change, let's say, the Mozambique place, the country, and put it in, in another place. So what we do 
is learn how to live with those uh, uh, extreme events. I want to borrow some words from the uh, Darwin. He say, "Is not the strongest of the peace that survives, and is not the smartest peace that survives, but uh, who survives is the one who has capability to adapt for adaptation. And we are all invited also for the adaptation. Also, Benjamin Franklin said, if you fail to prepare now, it means that you are prepared to fail in the future. So we have made service, health sector, together with the community of the, again, HSI. So we will sort out this problem. How to go this, ah, okay. Due to the localization of Mozambique, normally we have these outbreaks of a disease and the health center, of course, they are the one who in advance, they must bring this early warning so that the government can do the planification in order to uh, 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 save lives and uh, profit. We have made service also. We think that we are somehow the people the main the institution that produce the rich in the country because without the meteorological observation and uh, information most sector will not have their way for planning that's why the government has agreed to uh, for us to work together with the meteorological sector all the government when they are doing their planning they think of those objectives of the un number three they say all the government must bring what good health and the, what's this well-being but this is that doesn't work alone it works with also with the construction of resilient property for the health sector if, you, if we have an extreme event like a tropical cyclone for instance if the hospitals are destroyed so the all those people injured they will not have where to go that's why those two uh, 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 objects are working together but also without the objective number 13, which is climate action, all the 16 objectives, they, will, they won't succeed. That's why we integrate those three, meteorological service, health center, so that we can really uh, save lives and profits. Where does meteorological work start? Our work is just provide the data for the health center, then they will do their own job. Moderator discounted two minutes of introduction. It was not there. <laughs> so the first yellow one is the meteorological station. All the information starts from the meteorological station, which we need to take it through the communication and allocate in our database so that the, the health center can use it. Is it easy work? Yes, it is. But it's a challenge because we need to invest in this uh, equipment. My colleagues from Malawi has presented these laws also. This we have faced, we have presented to the community that we need to take this information from the meteorological observers. Let's see, Mozambique has 154 stations and the intention of, okay, okay. The intention of the president of Republic of Mozambique is to apply one meteorological station for each district. And together with the, the, the community, we will have this opportunity to collect this information by using the, the program that you, you guys are, are using. So this is the problem and the solution that will come with this community, when I met communities, DHSI, the community is to have the, the 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 mobile phones and the other technology that you better know so that the information can come from the uh, meteorological station uh, the, direct to the database but it's not only the real time that the health centers need is to 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 come up with early warning there's those data backward that are stored in the paper like like that for the researchers to do their work of course they need the digitalization and we are in the phase of digital transition. So we needed to digitalize those and the, the system or the, the project has come, thank you for the community and we are digitalizing those data. Experience with L1, of course, with this information, we'll be able to uh, uh, provide the information to the health center, the, 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 
the, the parameters that they need better. I don't know what they do with this, but to, what we do is just provide this information so that they can do all the work, all the study with malaria, cholera, and the, uh, 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 let's say diarrhea. Well, this is the, my, my last my last uh, slide. Major challenge for meteorological service, of course, support climate data collecting so that you can do the forecast, improving the climate data sharing. There was a question of sharing data, uh, improve the mechanism of uh, 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 climate data modeling. It's not just guessing. There are mathematical questions behind that, and the capacity building on uh, several aspects related to climate. For the health, let me leave it to my colleague so that you can proceed. I didn't tell her name. I didn't give her space to talk so that you can hear her beautiful voice from the first person. Thank you for that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Aderitu. Um, I'm going to present on behalf of National Institute of Health of Mozambique. My name is Tatiana Marufu, um, and I'm a researcher and the head of the National Health Observatory, which the technical secretariat is in this institution. So uh, our institution main roles are those that I've listed here. So first of all, uh, biomedical research and then laboratory systems, communication, education, um, and training, surveillance response to emergencies and health observation. And last, um, we have national and international, of course, partnerships for research, teach teaching, and also public health um, activities. In this presentation, uh, it's good to be the last because everything was already been said by the other countries. So I'll be very brief, <laughs> but I'm going to share uh, our um, um, initiatives uh, uh, within the National Health Observatory in terms of modding and activities that are related to climate and health. So this is our National Health Observatory and how we perform. This is actually our framework um, in which we use data from different data sources um, that runs into our platform, which is the National Health Observatory. We use data, uh, routine data, surveillance data, and uh, of health issues. We also use uh, survey reports and database and data from other sectors, definitely climate uh, data, um, environmental data, data from the social determinants of health, uh, vital statistics, and also uh, budget and economy data. So. As I said, this data runs into our platform uh, of the observatory, and we uh, actually perform two main activities. The first one is to do some kind of situation analysis, so most like descriptive analysis, trend analysis, and monitoring of indicators. And the second one is on um, modeling, in which we do risk analysis and mapping and also uh, predictions and scenarios of current and uh, future impacts. So uh, this actually analysis are translated in, into our analytical products, different ones that I've listed here, that can actually use for the decision-making process um, in, our, in our sector. So I'm going to give some of the examples of our activities. So in terms of risk mapping activities, we have been working with the Met Office in the past six, seven years. Yeah. <laughs> working uh, in terms of uh, forecasting um, uh, in terms of the risk of an outbreak of malaria and the real diseases for uh, the rainy season. So these are the different maps that we have developed since the season 28, it's missing here, uh, 2018 actually, 2018, 2019, it's missing, uh, but in the season 2019, 2020, it was the one that we actually performed for these two diseases. In 2018, 2019, it was only for malaria. It was the beginning of our work uh, together, uh, but we have been, uh, performance ever since and, and up to the, the previous uh, rainy season. 
it was 2023, 2024, and actually this week we are going to evaluate. Yes. There is a meeting this week on Friday to evaluate um, our predictions uh, in terms of the risk of an outbreak from malaria and the real diseases. So this is the process of um, actually running a model uh, in which we use uh, demographic data, we use climate data and our epidemiological data combining into a mathematical model. And we have um, came up with these risk maps for uh, our country. Uh, so far, it's at uh, the provincial level, but we are working to have these maps for the district level in the following forecasting. So um, that was the risk mapping in terms of long term, because we forecast for six months. This one, it's more like a short term, uh, the one that was already present. So in terms of the e-wars for WHO initiative, and we are actually working with WHO to predict um, the uh, formal area so far, um, and for up to 10 weeks in advance in terms of outbreak of uh, malaria. And this one, it's more local because it's for district level that we will have the probability of an outbreak uh, 10 weeks in advance. So this is our risk mapping in terms of short term. And I would love, I, I love this <laughs> activity. Actually, I always keep on presenting this. Uh, we have already published um, the, the first vulnerability and adaptation assessment. It's an example of triangulation data that we have done um, in Mozambique, um, not only using the climate data, of course, the climate data, it's very relevant for this work, but we have already used um, social demographical data and a lot of social determinants of health. We combine in this formula, as you can see, um, to actually uh, calculate the health vulnerability index of each one of the districts. At that time, because this was conducted in 2019, it was 160 districts, and now we have this index for all the 160 districts of Mozambique, and we are going to update this now after five years, so in 2024. Um, but we have already the index, and as you can see, uh, uh, Dr. Adarito was talking about the, the adaptation capacity, as you can see, Mozambique, in terms of health sector, the second map, it's more like red throughout the country, so we have a very low adaptive capacity to the climate change. Um, and actually, this is the only uh, in the factor that we can change the adaptive capacity. So we should work all together in terms of changing our capacity to adapt to the climate change, because all of the data that we use here, it's in terms of the health professionals that we have, in terms of preparation to cope with the impacts of climate change, the budget for the health sector, the access to health facilities. So this is the one, uh, the factors that we might change uh, in terms of climate change. Um, so of course there is a beautiful work, but there is a lot of challenge. Um, and some of them that uh, were already mentioned. So in terms of data, I think all of the countries have reported that the access and data sharing, it's a problem. Um, in, in particular, the data quality, it's a very relevant issue when it comes to data. Um, resources, of course, to have appropriate materials and equipments to run all the models and do the analysis, it's very re relevant. Um, capacity building, of course, not only for the health sector, but for both health sector, met office, not only at provincial and national, but at the local level, the one who's going to actually uh, run the intervention at the local level, if they are supposed to benefit for capacity building. And of course, uh, sustainability, we don't have, want to invest on new systems because we have already systems in place in country. So we should leverage from the ones that already exist and are working but definitely funds are required to leverage from those systems that we have in place. So in terms of solutions, 
what we have in face of all those challenges. We have uh, this DHIS2, I know how to say it. <laughs> <laughs> DHIS2 um, e-wars architecture um, perspective. Uh, in which um, a lot of data are input in this system. So data from the extreme weather events, meteorological data, climate data, data of uh, different types of incidents at local level. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, actually a chain of information and communication system uh, that has a lot of uh, data that could actually um, early detect or identify unwanted events. So this is how it works and can also uh, give a lot of notification using, for, for example, mobile uh, uh, platforms and even uh, direct to our users at, at the community, uh, apart from the beautiful dashboards that this can provide. So in short term, the intention of this um, Early warning system is actually to integrate in the HMIS um, for manage, of course, and prevent, mitigate, and provide the readiness and response to risk and treats. So, um, leverage leveraging for this welcome trust project. This is what we oversee in terms of um, what we have already initiated in our country. So to build uh, a central repository for climate change. So there is a climate hub uh, coming in uh, to improve uh, the collection of met data uh, from the stations. This is something that is already running. Um, and as I already mentioned, the DHS climate hub, it's running also to develop this interoperability layer that will allow met data to show or to share actually with the different key health partners um, to develop this innovative and digital mechanism for sharing information that will be produced by the climate health models. So the models that we already run, so leverage from that. And finally, but not least, to collaborate on the chat that we have been working last week. Um, and of course, using the INS modeling tools that we have already implemented, for example, for risk mapping. So this is what we oversee um, and what we think that our country could actually contribute for this new initiative and welcome project. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Any questions for these Mozambican guys that have a lot to do with red <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. But, yes, but is it okay? Yeah, yeah while well, the questions come in there. Yeah. While well, the questions come in there, yeah. There's already one question that was sent to colleagues from Malawi about data sharing. This is a, a very big issue. Okay, this, <laughs> maybe I reduce the volume. Yeah. Uh, like, yes, this is the big problem in the developing countries. Why? Because due to the lack of uh, finance, the lack of uh, annual budget for the for the med service, we rely on the data selling so that we can get cost recovery from those data. So uh, it's different with developing country where at this stage they are not selling raw data; they are selling products. Use the raw data, produce a product that is used, then they sell it. However. We have discussed it when I say we, the World Meteorological Organization, where most, almost all the countries are there, we have discussed of issues of data sharing during the Congress. And all the countries agree that there's a need to share data with your partners because I go back, we agreed in Paris 
to go for adaptation. You cannot adapt without L1, and the L1 indeed is the data that is observed. However, when you go for each country, each country has got its own data policy. Here is where the issue started. So to overcome this, each director of meteorological service is the permanent representative of its country with the World Meteorological Organization, which has a, a, a power to decide if you can share a, a, a data. But this is done as we did with a health center by signing MOU. Uh, you guys don't sell the data. I will give you data, but don't sell it for you to get the cost recovery, but for the research purpose so that you can save lives and the profits. So it's what we are. If you sell the data, then we will cut again, say, you know. <laughs> so this is the way we start by applying a memorandum of understanding between the institutions so that you can share data. Thank you very much both for your very interesting presentation. Um, I have a question to Tatiana. I'm really impressed with your risk mapping process that you've been doing over the past few years. Uh, my question is more on the utilization of this data. Like, how does it work? Do you have specific mechanisms to review that data uh, and basically to inform action? Is it only within the health sector or does it go, do you have some sort of multi-sectorial mechanism that uses that data to inform action? Thank you. Uh, okay, it's working. Okay, thank you for the question and the compliments of our uh, work um, for the past actually eight years yeah. <laughs> that we have been working. Um, so in terms of the use of data, primarily it's for the health sector, definitely. Um, I was mentioned uh, yesterday during our workshop that we took actually more time on uh, actually organizing the data because it comes in different formats, uh, data from the climate sector, from the social determinants, even from our own sector. So we lost a lot of time uh, organizing data. So maybe uh, DHS will help us on this issue, definitely. Um, and after that, we have this forum um, in which we uh, every year uh, are invited by the Met Office to be part of with other sectors, which are the agriculture sector is involved, water sector, uh, energy now. Um, roads, what is missing? Roads. Yeah, <laughs> okay, roads. so tourism. The roads, tourism. So a lot of uh, sectors, they we actually sit in one room for two or three days, uh, analyzing the forecast from the Met Office and then to produce our prognosis for our own sectors. So the data in this forum, it's shared between or across sectors. And uh, once we release actually uh, um, the forecast uh, for the Met Office and also involving other sectors, these data become available publicly uh, so everyone can use. Uh, of course, we have to actually translate it to our sector to support them to the contingency plans and also today uh, uh, in order that they can use for planification, uh, for planning and uh, at local level. And this is how it works uh, and uh, every year. And it's been a challenging uh, for our, our sector in particular because uh, the issues of climate were not uh, taken the, into account in the past, but uh, nowadays has changed. And everyone actually, after this event, they call me, what about the maps? We want the maps. So <laughs> are you are available now? And so it's very, um, useful for the sector and for different other sectors, definitely. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. I think uh, part of my question has been asked and uh, maybe partially have addressed, but uh, I want to understand uh, a scenario or a scenario where you averted uh, impact for health, for example, from your 
integration or whatever you have done so far you have presented you have like five maps do you have an actual case or scenario where you are able to avert uh, or inform the health sector in terms of planning and uh, response to outbreaks like malaria or even avert outbreaks like the cholera and AWD? That's one question. The second question is for all the three groups that presented. So in a case scenario where a country doesn't have the meteorological data or the weather data, how can they also benefit from in terms of uh, using the app uh, uh, to, to respond or that such kind of? Uh... Yeah, I guess the second question uh, Beyond can answer because it's uh, it's for all. You want to answer the second question? Okay. And this has data for all over the world. So all countries are covered. So this will be, be until you work on the with the Ministry of Metrology within your country, this is a very good early point. And the data, quality of the data is also quite good. So please consider that and we will tell you all the details. And then data is from 1960 onwards. So no worries. What else while you're waiting for Dodo to share data, you can actually use the available data through AirFi. Yeah. The, and that will also create some number one. pressure. Yeah. The rest yeah, of is number one. Ah, AirPress. Yeah, AirPress. I've got the map, I should have the impression. First question. Yeah. Um, start. Start. Yes. OK. Oh. Wait for I have one question. Uh, I'm so interested about uh, risk mapping uh, for malaria disease. Um, when I see you uh, make different, different map, different years. Yes, I. I would like to learn from you. Uh, actually, I, I I want to know uh, the methodology. Uh, with data you use to, to predict uh, year by year and uh, the also uh, uh, according to the climate, uh, you use the, uh, um, I would like to say, uh, yeah. it's like a predict data. I would like to know the, the procedure data you 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 do you you predict the map and also uh cli climate also and and health okay. i i i like to work like you okay <laughs> maybe i should maybe i should say that we are actually entering now into the networking session which is very timely for these kind of questions which are, uh, i think require a bit more depth than a, a short answer, but if you have a short answer, you are most welcome, Tatiana. <laughs> but we are actually now entering into the to the networking session. They will be served coffee, the coffee that you wanted to have earlier today, with snacks, but also snacks and drinks. You know, we it's a bit of networking and beer and wine and snacks and juice and coffee. Any if there are any burning questions, you can actually maybe during the networking. Yes. Directly, but thank you so much. I think this has been a wonderful session with a lot of good presentation. Thank you for all the audience as well.